So the people in the audience. They're the first group to be the people who are interested what happened when Army was attacked Swiss Post last December. Who's interested in more stories? Please raise your hand. Yeah, it's for a few of you. Great. I have something for you. <laughs> and then there are those who are really interested how to defend against request delaying or against slow orders. How do you want to, who wants to know how to defend these servers? And also a few. Good. I'll start with the story first and then I'll turn over to the defense afterwards. So, I'm Christian Follini. Uh, this is my CV. I'm an IT consultant based in Bern. There's a lot of Swiss among the companies I work for. So, there's a lot of Swiss federal services. I also work for one or two banks, a couple of other customers. I'm specialized in Apache security, a lot of more security work and a bit more general, all the unique stuff on the back context. <coughs> I've spoken at other conferences before, and I've taught a course or two, and in 2007 I developed a, a mod security rule editor. But before all this IT work, I, I studied actually history in Switzerland and abroad, and I have a PhD in medieval history. Uh, Equipped with this, this doctorate, I tried to make a living defending castles, if I do right. But as I had to find out, defending, making a living defending castle nowadays is kind of a... So I kind of shifted my focus into this industry. And I have to admit that server rooms are less attractive than a new castle. <laughs> but defending is just as interesting here. The application layer now serves. Let's start from the beginning. This is a Swiss Post memo from 2006. Performance testing guru David Fisher had just discovered a huge hole in our setup. With a single notebook, he was able to halt all post finds web servers. In a couple of seconds, actually. And the discussion ensued, and this memo was taken out of that discussion. I think it's these two statements a very typical risk profile. Very low risk of hitting you, and if it happens, you're pretty much toast. And then, of course, the low risk is difficult to assess. I mean, is this real? Could it happen to you? Has it happened to anybody else? Do we have to do something about it? And if, if that is a situation, then it's very hard to raise awareness internally, <laughs> and also to raise money to defend against this attack vector. So, they told us to slow down a bit. We set up a couple of monitoring scripts and we kind of put it back in the drawer of the heat. Personally, I was intrigued by this attack vector. I thought, this, that's supposed to be a, a really big thing. Am I the only one thinking it like that? So I approached the Apache developers and all. I think you guys have you told you. And they said, no, no, that's standard behavior. That's expected. We are a better server. We want to serve. If someone is approaching us and requesting a document, we're giving it to him. And if that's the DOS, then so be it. And I thought it's, it's kind of really the end. So I went to the mod security main list where we talked it through. What could happen? What could it be? How big could it be then? But still, I was not able to really hook up a real developer on the problem. And I didn't want to make this a big thing myself. It was a it was a customer who was vulnerable and so, so I pretty much kept the knowledge to myself and I continued to watch the city. Of course in 2007, 8, 9, there have been a lot of distributed denial of service attacks. You certainly heard about Estonia attacks. A lot of them, or a couple of them, have been application layer. That was just flooding a web server with a lot of requests. That is a nuisance that's really bad for the web server, but technically it's not very interesting. But had nothing seemed like a request delay. But then, in June 2007, American hacker Arsenic announced the proof of concept tool SlowLoris to HTTP DOS. SlowLoris is only exploiting a very small bit of the concept, but it's highly effective. And here it was, the secret was out in the wild knowledge. The hackers blog of Arsenic is read about it. Yes tens of thousands of people, so the world knew about it now. And I had a lot of knowledge to defend against, because I've been thinking for years about this. And I felt like, I have to tell, and I have to share my knowledge now. The timing is incredibly bad. 
This was in June 17, 2009. My wife was expecting the first baby really soon now, and I had an appointment to defend Korea across the weekend that followed. So I, I knew I had to be really quick here, <laughs> and I approached uh, Linux Weekly News, an online uh, newsletter, newspaper, to talk about the uh, slow lorries and what you could defend against. And said, yeah, we're finding it logical to be really quick. And I worked like mad, and Wednesday night, my article came out. Four hours afterwards, baby was born. So for completeness, here is my boy, Matteo. He played a significant role in this. By the way, he was catching an EOS attack plan. I'll get back to this later on. Then again, nothing big happened anymore. So Slow Loris was out in the wild. It was slowly popping up here and there in the US attacks. If you read the news, oh, already a bit far ahead. It's so already uh, popping up here and there again, but no real big attack thing. Matteo is doing great. I'm, uh, I continue to configure Apaches. Sky was blue. There was an organization called WikiLeaks starting to make, to publicize stuff that was secret before. And then suddenly, in early December, there was an internal message to his post that they were, they were preparing a press release that they would close down the, the account of Julian Assange, WikiLeaks. This was the press release. Came out this Monday afternoon. And it didn't take very long. I mean, if you have something like that, bingo, now we have the DOS. It took a couple of minutes or the most one hour, and then we had a really big DOS. Uh, this is a TCP traffic statistic. Look at the upper graph. On the left, you see typical weekdays, that were Thursday and Friday, then a slow weekend, standard Monday taking off. And at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, when the traffic was supposed to go down again, it would start to rise. Rising up to midnight, then the Packers went to sleep. Isn't that nice? He was going to sleep all night. And then on Tuesday morning, they were throwing all the script the world had to offer a Swiss Post. It was a huge chaotic attack with everything you'd ever heard about. There was slow lorries, high lorries, slow posts, and above all, Loic tool, and a lot of network DOS tool as well. I'm not going to speak about network DOS. There is a lot of knowledge about it. I'm concentrating on the application layer here. So, so what is this application layer of denial of service attack. What did I really do? Here we have two script TDs preparing for an EOS attack. Okay. Matteo told me their plan is, so this teddy bear and him, they want to go to the local post office in the village. They're teaming with two, and they're ready in coins now. What they want to do is each one of them is approaching the counter and starting to make a big payment very small coins. You've all been in a cash or in a shop somewhere where usually an old lady is picking up coins. <laughs> this can take ages, can't it? And given she has enough coins, or given these two guys here have enough coins, they can basically block the counter forever. This is legal. This is protocol compliant behavior. You just push coins over the counter. That's what they want to do. They want to block the local post office forever, then do an extortion, they get a lot of lollies, and they're happy, and they go off again. That's a business case for them. Still, I believe Swiss Post will not really be that much affected. Why is that? There are two reasons for that. The clerk at the counter is no fool. He will know, he will stand quickly, but these two guys are up to you. They'll give them a lolly and they show off. And second is, Swiss Post is a lot of post office. You can maybe make a sitting in one or two of them. You make a national campaign, you do a big sitting, but you cannot block all of them, can you? It's literally impossible. So many post offices. But hold on, Swiss Post has only a single online banking site. That's the big difference. The second difference is that's no smart person on the side. It's a web server. It's pretty dumb. It's very stupid. It doesn't know what the game is here. 
it's is protocol compliant, then it will talk to the customer. This is an application layer attack. It's protocol compliant. He will not even notice. So the attack Maboyan is telling you are planning is ineffective in the real world. But in the online, online world, it's extremely effective. It's very, very dangerous. This is an Apache status page, the beginning of the flow of this attack. Here on the right, where all the question marks are and the reading bit, <coughs> here is you are supposed to see your clients here. But during a flow of this attack, in the beginning, you don't see your clients, which is something is happening at other one. At the peak of the attack, like after five seconds, there is no status page in there. And that's true for the whole server. If you look at the I.O. server, nothing happened. Load on the server, almost zero. Access log, empty. There are no requests. Only if you look at next stuff, you see a huge mass of connections, but nothing is happening. We're really puzzled if you see this for the first time. So what this slow or is thing and the other tool exploiting the same weakness are doing is they initiate a connection, they keep it alive, but they never finish the request, possibly extending the request as long as they possibly can, probably forever. So this is what anonymous network used against Swiss Post, and this is how they attack their servers. Here is what they thought they were doing. A statement taken from IOC. Remember, this is 21st century. You're in IOC together with your attackers. This is the plan. So they want to take out post finance, and post finance will have to pay a lot of money to <coughs> release. We we put about defenses and defend it against. It takes usually a few hours. And this is their post attack analysis. The bottom statement is the most interesting one. So post finance is complete down and we attack them and they have to block all non Swiss IPs. They'll do the same if we attack again. It's not a long term target. So I can I cannot really confirm that we will complete the down, but I can certainly confirm that as soon as the attack didn't work anymore, they worked off and went to Sweden to attack a lawyer who was involved in the case against Clue and Son. For me, it was kind of sad that they would shove off so quickly, because after about like 20 hours or so, we had recovered almost completely again. And the time the attack window was too short to try out all the defenses we had in mind. So we had to prepare the stuff, take it out of the drawer, put it in practice, and then one of the first ones would actually work, and then they went off. It was a bit sad, but, but still, <laughs> customers are kind of happy. Uh, let's go back to the meme. So here in 2006, I made two statements. Very low probability, and if it happens, we're toast. I was kind of wrong with both, wasn't I? I mean, either my estimation of being very low was wrong, but it was a severe case of bad luck. But you never is really difficult to calculate. It will happen, especially <coughs> in the world. And then I predicted it would be a complete disaster. But it wasn't a complete disaster after all. I mean, it was a nuisance. It was a partial outage. It was a downtime of some sort. It was a stressful situation, but it was not a catastrophe for Swiss Post. And the point is, it could have been. We faced a fairly chaotic, artistic network, the anonymous network. They were not very dedicated, they were not very thought through, and they did not really have a cool plan that they were planning to do. They were just attacking us like mad, and then they went off again. So, against a real persistent attacker, this could have been a lot worse. In practice, what it's all about is the problem of strict differentiation. The German term is Trendschärfe. I think that's a very good word. It means if you cut the good thing on one side and the bad traffic on the other side, how good is your cut in the middle? And the problem here is you're blind. 
This is encrypted traffic. So the net washer, the firewall, the IDS IPS, local entity, they are all blind to this attack. The first one who sees anything at all is, is the device terminating SSL. Usually the web server. It could be your local answer or a device in Chrome, but that device does not know about your application. So probably you can inspect the traffic, but the traffic is probably compliant. So a front-end device is a problem to tell that traffic can be good traffic. Because if it is the web server who's terminating SSL, he's a very bad defender because he, he's willing to serve and stuff. He wants to give it up. And he's not very good at in fact uh, identifying clients to play with him. <coughs> so what's the point here? When I uh, talked to a patch developer from 2006, I and mean, when Arsenake approached him with a slow office tool, they would tell him that it's, it's like nothing we can do. Why is that? Why can't you do something about that? <coughs> so I felt, or I feel like, if the, if the stats are so bad for you, if everybody keeps telling you, and even the literature documentation is telling you, there is nothing whatsoever you can do, that's where the fun really starts. I mean, if you try to defend the servers again, against all odds, you're going to have a cool time. So here's what you can do. You have to know your architecture by heart. That's easily said, and it's actually quite difficult, especially for a big enterprise. Big enterprises are set up in a way that they cut things in slices. And it's very hard to get an overview of your architecture. But you need to know the exact bandwidth between the, the elements in your network, in your DMZ. You, you need to know the CPU, the server size, and the RAM and the usual stuff. You need to know the certificates being used and the algorithm within it because they, they fire back on your CPU. You need to know the operation system on your switch, for example. That could be a weak spot here. You should also know the protocols. Here we're mostly talking about HTTP and HTTPS. Yes, all of you know HTTP fairly enough. Who has never looked at an HTTP header in the room? You know how this looks, do you? But who can explain HTTP keep alive and how it influences, influences low dollars attacks? In simple terms. That's where, where the complexity starts. The point is, by using HTTP keep alive on an SSL session, you're, you're reserving RAM and saving CPU. Now, RAM is cheap enough nowadays, but the side effect is that you're reusing the same TCP session on the encrypted traffic. So you make a TCP session lasting longer and thus resembling a slow loris attack session. So by using HTTP keep alive over SSL, you make your legitimate traffic look a lot more like an attacking traffic. That's the problem here in the defense. So you have, we have to not understand HTTP and HTTPS if you want to tell legitimate traffic from the attacking traffic. You have to know your application. Well, that seems simple enough. But usually, it is good enough to get a kind of an understanding of the application. But here, you need to know a lot more. You have to know the URLs the application uses. You have to know the access patterns. You have to know what you can use it for. How is the authentication? Are there parts which are not authenticated? Are there parts which are authenticated? What does a typical log file look like when someone uses the application? And you're better off knowing this beforehand and not trying to learn it during the attack. You have to know your customers. Who are they? Are they groupable? Can you communicate with your customers outside of the website if it's down? Will your customers, will they accept downtime? And if so, how much? That's all very important to know beforehand, so you can afterwards tell <coughs> legitimate traffic from attacking traffic. You should know your allies and their phone number. If Slow Loris and the like is hitting you, usually you're quite su surprised. You've seen the, uh, the status page of Apache. That's quite an astonishing you see for the first time. So you need to know somebody who's not as surprised as you are. You need to know experts. In the case of Swiss Post, uh, the Melanie guys have been really helpful because they had a previous knowledge about this and they made us feel like we're not alone in this. So we had a phone number of somebody. If you think you could be the next target, get in touch with me or somebody else. There are a lot of people around 
who have a bit of knowledge about this. You have to know your tools, because eventually it is tools who will help defend you. There is no silver bullet here. It is a selection of tools combined in the right way for the attack you're, you're facing. And the more tools you know, and the more things you've tried out and are able to combine, the more likely you're able to defend against. And then you should have a defense plan. Without a good plan, you turn into what I call headless chicken mode. You run around like mad, but nothing really fixable. So you have to make a plan first, and in the plan, somebody has to clear you to take certain measures. Do you remember the, the second statement? Give an IRC. So apparently somebody inside Swiss Post had cleared us to shut out all IP addresses outside of Swiss Post. Usually the big actor you're not allowed to do this yourself. So somebody has to clear you. And in the plan, In the defense plan, this is listed. Then that, that person in that moment will give the clearance to do this. That's why it takes a bit of time to defend in a big enterprise. Because their processes, it's very slow. And I think you have to defense this and uh, write this down beforehand. And then you should know your enemies. In the case of anonymous network, it's very easy. Because during the attack, they're raising attackers on Twitter. They're calling and they're inviting people to write IRC chat, chat channels where they are planning the attacks. So we simply join them. That's very easy. So with all this knowledge gathered, what are you going to do afterwards? You should think about using an event-based web server. So Apache, in its default, default setup, is connection oriented. That's like a post office I talked earlier before. You step up to the counter, somebody's coming on the other side, and then you're dealing with each other. And he's waiting until you're done. He's using keep alive, meaning if you have new payment afterwards, you're using the same TCP connection in the post office. Now, an event-based web server is different. They have pool of workers, and you're alone at the counter, and you deposit your payment, and as soon as you finish, somebody approaches, takes the work, and moves back again. That doesn't very good, look very good in the real world. That's no customer relationship. But for a web server, that's a huge performance boost. Now, Apache does have an event-based and uh, processing unit, but it doesn't do SSL. They, I mean, serious attacker, of course, use SSL. So Apache cannot help in this regard. People often point to endings for like HTTP. These are really hot machines. They're event-based. They're a lot faster. But they have other limits. And uh, some of the videos I present on the next slide will not work with these fast machines because you don't get as much granular control on an Apache. And in the end, even their resources are limited. Somewhere you'll hit the roof. So I think you're still quite well off Apache, even if, if it's only all the sponsors and hangings. You should also think about routing your traffic for an external specialist in case of an attack. Now, chances are, if you do online banking, you will not be allowed to route your SSL traffic and, and terminate the SSL traffic outside, of course. But it's still an option. Specialists, they have a lot more computing power in their racks than you do, usually. And they really know what they're doing, so they're a lot better than us here are at filtering the traffic. Because they do it for them in this daily business. You should really understand that you keep alive and decide if you really need it. My personal belief is that most people don't need HTTP client. The chances are that most of you guys, or even the guys around you think you absolutely need I think you should really think this through and make a reasonable decision if this is necessary or not. Timeouts. For God's sake, lower your timeouts. The false timeouts are way too high. We're no longer in the 20th century. Somebody is not able to send a TCP packet every five seconds, and something is broken. Apache default timeout is like 100 or 300 seconds. And the size of the, of the length of the timeout is your attack window. So if you're lowering the timeout to like three seconds, then it gets fairly small. What Slow Loris is doing is he's sending you packets a, a little in a rhythm which is a bit shorter than the timeout. 
So here I'm telling the Solaris, you have to send your package every three seconds. If this is 300 seconds, of course, it's far easier to attack me. I think that's logical. Uh, there is mod rec timeout, that's an Apache module. Mod rec timeout is a single module which comes closest to a silver bullet here. Solaris is no longer a problem with mod rec timeout. The problem is, on a real world service, I think the sophisticated attacker can easily engineer this attack around mod rec timeout. Because he will not attack the HTTP request added phase, he will turn to the body. And this is where mod rec timeout is too general. It applies to the whole server. It does not apply to a single URL. That's the problem here. So there's an alternative that's mod QoS on Pascal Book Window. He's based in Winterthur. That's a great, huge module with all sorts of QoS stuff. It's less specific than mod rec timeout but much more in general. And there are quite a few directives in the module which can help you in the situation. Then you should use GeoIP. If you look at a log file and you see a lot of IP addresses, they, they don't say anything to you. But if you, know, if you know your application and you know there are very few customers from the far end of the world, and suddenly, with the help of GeoIP, you identify hundreds of IP connections from, say, uh, Malaysia, then you know there's something wrong here. Without GeoIP, we don't have any numbers. GeoIP helps big time. <coughs> then you should use Nesta. As I've previously shown, Apache does not tell you about a connection, or the access log doesn't tell you about a request until it's finished. The status page does not work in a slow log is attacked. Nesta, on the other hand, tells you immediately when a connection is established. And if, if you see somebody having a connection, not finishing it, not showing up in the access log, you take that and get side if you can black the markers. Use TCP dump. TCP dump, uh, TCP dump helps a lot. Uh, you would say this is SSL traffic, it's all encrypted. But actually, the guys at Melanie, they gave us a hint. You should use TCP dump on this traffic. Then you know how an SSL handshake usually works. I mean, that's very discreet. Client approaches, let's do an SSL handshake. That is encrypted, you don't see anything. Not so our friends from the anonymous networks. Hey, wait, please, wait, let's do an SSL handshake. Bingo, that's a pattern. <laughs> you take the IP address, you use it to blacklist. But IP blacklisting, very important. You need a generic way to blacklist IP addresses. Put this on the perimeter, somewhere far off from your PM set. You find out the IP address, you propagate it to the front, and you tell the system they're wrong. You never want to see this IP address for the duration of the attack. That's really important. Script, pass an IP address, a timeout along which should be blocked, and then you forget about the IP address. That's very helpful. You should look into mod security. Mod security, again, is not really a, an anti DDoS tool, but it has one or two directives which could help. And with everything Apache security related, you want to use mod security because it gives you a very good detailed look into requests. You can log a lot more than in the access log. And it gives you a lot more granular control. So if you want to filter something, mod security is very helpful. And then of course the mod security mailing list has a very great knowledge about Apache security. It's a great place to hang out this kind of stuff. You should look into mod vector. That's a funny thing with a very stupid name. What vector does is it puts a bit of resources aside for you. So you've seen the status page. Without the mod state and mod vector, you wouldn't see the status page anymore. But mod vector gives you a VIP access to the status page. That's helpful. And then you should think about separating file uploads from the rest of the application. And that's the problem here. HP request headers, not break them out, problem solved. Slow or is no longer an issue. But a dedicated attacker, he will attack the request body. And you cannot limit these. I mean, they could be big. It really depends on the application. You have to know your application. You have to know how big the file uploads are. And if you, and if you have an application which has to accept multiple megabytes of file uploads, 
and you can really slow down the upload of multi megabytes if you want to. Then you should try to separate this from the rest of the application, meaning the main application can be really tight on the timeouts and really now you, you deliver your stuff, and if you're not done in five seconds, I shut you out. And you separate the file of those to separate different server, different URL. That's a great thing doing defense. And finally, you should forget about Motivasic. Old documentation, even modern ones, there was quote this Motivasic stuff. It doesn't work. That's for other stuff. It doesn't work on the application layer. Sophisticated pattern. So these are your, your tools. Now how do you use them? Slowbar is type EDS on all the young stuff around it, exploring the same concept. They don't finish their request. That's the whole point. So you have next on one side, you see the connections, and you have the access log on the other side. And there's a delta in between. If you block the connections and never finishing one, these are the IP addresses that attack you, these are the offenders. You blacklist them immediately. This, but this means you have to you have to look at Netslot all the time. On the DUS tools and the application level, they actually do full requests, but they're not really a problem. If you know the application and if you know your log files by heart, you know how a client behaves in your application. Very often the attack tools don't do that. They don't fetch CSS files, they don't fetch JavaScript, they don't fetch images. And if you see this pattern in your, in your log file, bingo, you have them again, you can block them. And finally, uh, for the basic stuff, there's a typical median lifetime of connection to your application. Even with HTTP keep alive, kind of standard application user has a TCP connection lifetime. And if you see that the average lifetime, or like the median, is shifting, probably there's an attack happening right now. And if a single client is going too far away from the median, then maybe he is the attacker. You can block him. Of course, this will be collateral. This will produce a lot of collateral damage. But if you are under attack, and you're not constantly under attack, but if you are under attack, you can pull the lever and say, okay, now we set the block. Now the relay wants up. You should have an agent that keeps all this information together. He has to supervise the connections. So he's not simply doing next step out of every five seconds, but he sits on the, on the interface and every connection should be built up. He puts in a table and he keeps a lot of them. And when it goes away, then he removes it from the table. But he also looks at the application log files to, to see the delta. And what is very important is he has a login log. So he knows that's a non-authenticated user from this IP address. And from that IP address, he was able to, to submit the real credentials. And that is really important for your application. Because these guys are good guys. They have the credentials for your applications. You want to work with them. But if somebody is hanging out on your application probably a couple of minutes and it's an online banking application, then you can make a guess it could be an attacker. If he's not logging in, I can shut him out during the attack. Then if you if you know the login log, then you can look for clients accessing the wrong URLs. I mean he's not logged in, but he's already attacking as if he was logged in. You can shut him off. Then you can look for clients who use the wrong method on the wrong URL. <coughs> there is no point in doing a post request with a big re request body on the index HTML. Standard web server will happily accept that. But if you know your application, and if you know a bit about uh, HTML, you know it doesn't make sense at all. But keeping track of the login users, <coughs> keeping track of every connection, the access log, and their entities, you can filter out them fairly easily. Then you should look for clients having an ethical order of requests. I mean, standard is you request slash or index HTML, and then your follow-up request, and then sometimes you put the first post request, the login, etc., etc. If somebody's having a different uh, request order, you can identify them. And you should also look for clients with that typical request structure, like a funny ring in his requests. Maybe that's a bot. It's not a browser. Usually. Users do a couple of requests and then a longer pause. And then again, I get requests, a few follows, uh, images being loaded and then slow, slowing down again. That's very typical in the log file. And an attacker very often nowadays doesn't do that. So they're like hammering or 
steady rhythm, or they do too many post requests related to the get requests. In the standard application, there are very few post requests, a lot of get requests. If there are a lot of post requests and no get requests, then it's infected. There's no point in doing that against your application. So all combined here, I think you have to know the application by heart. You have to know the log files, you have to know the behavior. And if you know all this and know your tools, you're able to set up a specific defense for your servers and your applications. And this is knowledge which only you can have. That's why there is no machine or no device, no standard product that you can buy and it works. It cannot, because your application is specific. And you will have to configure it to defend yourself. That's basically what I have, but then I have a bonus page. That's stuff which I have not tried out myself. My group from Computech, it's a German or a Swiss uh, uh, info forum. He has a browser reconnaissance project. I have not tried this out for myself. But he, what, he do, what he does is try to identify the browser. And if you're not able to identify the browser as a real browser, then chances are high that it is a bot. So I believe his project is helping in the defense. And a very similar thing is being done by Haven Ristich, the guy, the initial guy behind Mod Security, and the person who wrote the patch security book. And by the way, in a some way cryptic way, he predicted slow loss in 2005. That was even a year before we first talked about it. So he is having a project where he's analyzing the SSL handshake and trying to find out which browser that is and what client. Again, this could help to identify an attacker. That is, that is very interesting because the SSL handshake happens first. So you're very early in the request, a lot before the post request is, is starting, you will be able to identify a bot or a standard browser. Yeah, that's it. Thanks a lot.
I think it's the same situation with a different technique. So it's not increasing, for example? Uh, <coughs> Probably yes, but I couldn't make it. We don't have information. I'm not the expert on the quantity of, of the attacks. Okay. But I think uh, what happened in Switzerland is that the post-finance case in December raised the awareness that insiders knew this could happen for a couple of years now, even longer with the smart people. But uh, now it's like in the wild and it could happen to anybody, basically. Okay, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, you proposed to uh, lose a round hand over an external specialist. In, was that just a case of a double attack? Or would you uh, generally um, try to outsource at least the end page of the international round hand? What's your thing? Oh, I'm not a uh, cloud service salesperson here. So it depends on the case. I couldn't make a recommendation. So do you, but do you think it could be done in a, in a short period of time? To yeah, specialists do this, yes. Yeah, there are specialist companies, I don't know if they're in Switzerland, but they do this. You make you make your preparations beforehand, they tell you how to prepare, and if it happens, you give them a ring, and then you rerun. Yeah, that's... There are... Uh, yeah, you browse the internet, there are a couple of people around you. It's their business. We take your VOS traffic on our network. See that? Just a question about this one. I was thinking the uh, main name about how to mitigate the end of service. What do you think about maybe using mode security plus your validation? That means try to eliminate some country, for example. Yeah. What is your idea about that? Okay. The, the point here is that the chances are that your firewall, firewall does not do KOIP, surprisingly enough. So the first one is actually able to do this. The IBS or maybe something monitoring. So the web server can do KOIP. And mod security has a directive for KOIP blocking. Okay. And then there is a special Apache module where you simply fill in the, the name of the countries. Point again is if you let them come down to the web server, that's probably already too far. So what you can do is during an attack, for example, you can drop them yeah. based on KOIP yeah. and then you take the log file from an agent, you process it, and forward these IP addresses to the front. <laughs> and make a listen. Like, this is the guy I dropped here, and I don't want to see him again. Ah, uh, okay, you need to create a kind of ACL. Yes, dynamically. Okay. So yeah. That's why I was, I was saying you need a generic blacklisting service who's mm -hmm. not really plugged into it, right? He's there, and you can use and feed IP addresses into it. Uh, wherever you get it. Yeah, but it could, it could be interesting to have something in real time. Let's see if there's a map where the attack happens. Yeah, that's right. It's just an idea. Yeah, no, real time uh, AYP on maps is fun. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Okay, should we start with the quiz now? Do you want to I don't know. Yeah. I don't remember the questions. Oh, yeah, 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 keep alive. Pet topic, HP, keep alive. <laughs> <laughs>
question or the easy one. That's boring. I'll take it.